Jesus or the Church? Part 4. Was the Trinity a political solution? In an attempt to analyze the reasons why the Church adopted the Trinity, which in essence was a clear betrayal of the Scripture and the teachings of Jesus who never claimed divinity, a number of factors are of significance. One at that time, and unlike today, the Church had a double role. First, the Church was a constitution that provided spiritual guidance and a place of worship to people. Additionally, the Church was effectively involved in ruling the land. Religion and politics were inseparable. Anyone who dared oppose the Church was very severely punished. The Church being all too aware of the history of the people of Israel, knew that many prophets have come and gone and then forgotten. The Church was also aware that since the heart of the faith was the figure of Jesus Christ, then to maintain that kind of authority the Church had to keep the faith in Jesus intact. Effectively, the best insurance to guard against a forgotten Jesus figure would be the creation of a divine Jesus figure, for though a prophet may be forgotten, a god will never be. Thus, if Jesus was made into a god figure, the Church would never lose its commanding authority. Two during the years that followed the death of Jesus, there was a growing conflict between the new monotheistic followers of Jesus and the multi-god Roman paganism. The Trinity Doctrine, which suggests that God is one, but also three, was a convenient reconciliation between the two opposing doctrines. When asked to explain how can God be one and three simultaneously, or how can God be the Father and His own Son at the same time, the traditional reply of the Church is nothing other than just have faith. In other words, it does not matter if it does not make any sense as long as you believe what they are telling you. But surely any concept that is self-contradictory must harbor a defect in its core. The truth is never irrational. The word a trinity is not found in the New Testament nor was it ever preached by Jesus. It is an encroachment on the scripture. It is philosophically inconsistent and mathematically absurd. No sooner do we abandon the attempts to find a rational definition of the Trinity or the Father and the Son, do we come across yet another confusing title, that is the title of the Lord? Most Christians today think of Jesus as the Lord, but in the Bible the matter is not as clear-cut. Consider the following verses. One and the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. Exodus 34 verse 6. It is clear from this verse that the Lord is God. To yet for us there is only one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we live for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6. Here the Lord is Jesus. The verse also asserts that only the Father is God. A clear distinction is evident in this verse between God and Jesus. 3 We also read, The Lord is the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 3 verse 17. From the above verses we realize that the Lord is any one of the three. In that sense, there is not much difference in the word Lord or the word God. Thus all who say, Our Lord Jesus Christ, are in fact saying, Our God Jesus Christ. What it boils down to is that, since Christian ideology perceives the Father and the Son as one, there seems little need for the terms Father and Son inside a Trinity configuration. Some advocates will speak of the Trinity in the manner of one God in three forms. They add that there is no mystery at all since God at all times is one but the plurality is one of form. For as a frog exists as a tadpole and also as a frog but at the end is still the same creature. This is fine except for one slight problem. The tadpole and the frog are not able to exist simultaneously, it is either tadpole or frog. If they existed simultaneously they would ipso facto be two creatures. In the case of Jesus, we have seen how the Bible contains ample evidence of a clear distinction between Jesus and God. Jesus always acknowledged the existence of God external of himself. The following verses all make that clear distinction. My Father is greater than I, John 14 verse 28. Not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what God in heaven wants them to do. Matthew 7 verse 21 Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. Mark 10 verse 18 And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. John 17 verse 3 So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. Mark 16 verse 19. 
If Jesus and God are one, these verses and many others which clearly speaks of two beings, would make very little sense. Atonement and the Original Sin The concepts of the atonement and original sin are equally precarious and not without inconsistencies. To claim that Jesus suffered and was crucified to atone for our sins is philosophically immoral. Not only does this conviction render little sense to the merits of punishment and reward, and thus to heaven and hell, but more dangerously. Such belief could be regarded as a license to disregard righteousness as long as one believes in Jesus. In essence, the atonement doctrine contradicts the Old and New Testaments. Old Testament Also to you O Lord, belong mercy, for you render to each one according to his work. Psalm 62 verse 12 And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? Proverbs 24 verse 12 The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Ezekiel 18 verse 20 New Testament Each of us shall give an account of himself to God. Romans 14 verse 12 Each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 8 All these verses testify that faith alone is not sufficient, but that the reward is also very much dependent on one's work, deeds, righteousness, and a labor. The concept of Jesus dying to take away our sins is a corruption that has been added to the scripture. The following is a vivid piece of evidence. From the New Testament we read. From Zion shall come the Deliverer, he shall remove wickedness from Jacob. And this is the covenant I will grant them, when I take away their sins. Romans 11 verses 26-27 This verse is the fulfillment of the prophecy in Isaiah. The Ransomer of Zion and of all in Jacob who repent of their rebellion. This is the very word of the Lord. This, says the Lord, is my covenant which I make with them. My spirit which rests on you and my words which I put into your mouth shall never fail. Isaiah 59 verses 19 to 21. By comparing the two verses we realize that the words, when I take away their sins, do not exist in Isaiah. It is clear that they have been added to the verse in Romans to justify the atonement doctrine. Another doctrine that was never taught by Jesus is the concept of the original sin. According to this irrational concept we all have to atone for the sin of Adam. Thus we are all born with an original sin that we have to atone for. This concept, which claims that newborn babies are born with a sin, contradicts all the previous verses that assert that every man will be accountable to his own deeds and labor, and that no man shall bear the sin of another. Furthermore, this concept contradicts the words of Jesus as in the following verse. Let the children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 19 verse 14 since there is no sin in heaven, and of such, children, is the kingdom of heaven, one is led to believe that children are free of sin. Such concepts that were never taught by Jesus, but were added sometime after his death. Inevitably causes the Christian a dilemma when attempting to reconcile his acceptance of the Old Testament, with his rejection of Judaism. This becomes particularly evident with regards to the following question. How can the one indivisible God of the Old Testament become a three-in-one in the framework of the Trinity? Has God always been three-in-one? If yes, then why was this knowledge not given to the people of Israel? Why was this knowledge kept a secret even during the life of Jesus, then only made manifest 325 years later, at the Council of Nicaea? Why was this knowledge kept a secret even during the life of Jesus, then only made manifest 325 years later, at the Council of Nicaea? The Old Testament gives account of numerous prophets who delivered scripture from God, why did they all testify to a one indivisible God? Due to all these questions that do not receive satisfactory answers, one is not surprised to find churches almost empty today and being accused of a double think which is defined by George Orwell as. Double think means the power to hold two contradictory beliefs simultaneously, and accepting both of them. 1984, George Orwell, page 220. The gross case of a double think is upholding the oneness of God and the Trinity simultaneously. Another case is evident in Article 7 of the 39 Articles of the Church of England which states, 
the Old Testament is not contrary to the New. However, and as was demonstrated, many concepts that appear in the letters of Paul contradict the Old Testament. What must be stressed here is the fact that the teachings of Jesus never contradicted the Old Testament. After all, he confessed to the following. Think not that I am come to destroy the law, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Matthew 5 verses 17 to 18. It is no surprise that many reputable scholars have openly opposed such concepts as the Trinity. This group of Christians, who were to be known as the Unitarians, insisted on the oneness, indivisibility, of God. They emphasized the historical Jesus, and avoided the use of the term Son. The earliest Unitarians include Irenaeus, Diodorus, Lucian and Arius. Irenaeus, 130-200 A.D., who was put to death in 200 A.D., bitterly opposed Paul for injecting pagan and Platonic philosophy into Christianity. Lucian who was also put to death for his beliefs in 312 A.D., opposed the tendency to look for symbolic and allegorical meanings in the scripture. He believed that Jesus is subordinate to God. Arius, 250-336, who was one of the pupils of Lucian, was one of the greatest critics of the Pauline Church. The Unitarian School of Christianity continued to flourish to include a great host of scholars. In his historical account, Sir Isaac Newton, 1642-1727, is quoted saying the following about the Trinity. Let them make good sense of it who are able. For my part one can make none. Anti-Trinitarian Biographies 3, A. Wallace, page 428. Joseph Priestley, 1733-1804, who discovered oxygen, also affirmed the humanity of Jesus and opposed the Trinity. Others include the poet Milton, 1608-1674, William Channing, 1780-1842, and John Locke, 1632-1704. The church was not instituted by Jesus. He never advocated a hierarchy of priests to act as mediators between God and man. Yet, the church today teaches Christians that their salvation would be assured if they acted as the church told them. From where did the church derive this authority? The validity of such authority is today being rejected on a scale that has never been known before. One of the turning points occurred as far back as 1755 in the Great Lisbon Earthquake, in which hundreds of Christians died in church while celebrating the Mass. Coinciding as it did with the Age of Reason, it caused the whole concept of salvation to come under a very severe hammering. The Case Against God, Gerald Priestley, page 16. George Harrison of the Beatles summed it up very nicely with the following words. When you're young you get taken to church by your parents and you get pushed into religion at school. They're trying to put something into your mind. Obviously because nobody goes to church and nobody believes in God. Why? Because they haven't interpreted the Bible as it was intended. Taught just to have faith, you don't have to worry about it, just believe what we are telling you. Christianity on Trial, Colin Chapman, page 37. With those words, George Harrison was indeed bringing to attention a very serious phenomenon. Many people who turn their backs on the church today and are disenchanted with religion do so because of the misinterpretations that George Harrison referred to rather than their denial of God. The divinity of Jesus, a concept adopted by the church and never taught by Jesus, also contributes greatly in turning Jews away from believing in Jesus the Messiah of whom their prophecies speak. In the Old Testament the Messiah and King of Jews is a prophet sent to the people of Israel. He is another prophet in a sequence of many prophets. The teachings of Jesus were on the same line as those before him. But sadly the corrupted version taught by the church today, which is more the teachings of Paul than Jesus, has made Christianity become isolated from Jewish theology. The Trinity, the God Incarnate, the Resurrection, the Atonement, the Original Sin, and other corrupt doctrines have alienated Christianity from the mainstream of Jewish revelations. The dedicated atheist and philosopher Sir Alfred Ayer had this to say. Christianity is based on the notion of vicarious atonement which shocks me not only intellectually but morally. If I have a child I don't punish his brother for what he did, and that is exactly what Christianity is based upon. Sir Ayer proceeds to show distaste for God's massacre of the Jews throughout the Old Testament then he adds. Here you have your deity who did all this, and then he said suddenly, people are behaving badly. I am going to transform myself into a human being and suffer vicariously for sins have to be atoned for by a sacrificial lamb. So Christ is supposed to atone for the sins that other people committed. The whole thing is not only intellectually contemptible but thoroughly outrageous. The Case Against God, Gerald Priestland, page 18.
It is not surprising, and due to the poor argumentative content of such doctrines, to find Christianity constantly changing to conform to current values. T.S. Eliot put it very well when he said, Christianity is always adapting itself into something which can be believed. The Myth of God Incarnate, edited by John Hick, page 9. To conclude, it is quite apparent that the real Jesus of the Bible, also referred to as the historical Jesus, is quite different from the divine figure falsely portrayed by the Church. Nowhere in the Bible is Jesus portrayed as the earthly incarnation of God. There is no evidence in the Bible to support the Atonement doctrine, nor is there any evidence that Jesus taught or believed in his own divinity. Finally, it is apt to end with the words of Jesus which he directed at all those who idolized and worshipped him instead of worshipping God. Not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what God in heaven wants them to do. When judgment day comes many will say to me, Lord, Lord. In your name we spoke God's message. Then I will say to them, I never knew you, get away from me you wicked people. Matthew 7 verses 21-23